you in my sights, mister. I'll give you just five seconds to stand up and explain yourself. Would you by any chance be John James Audubon, painter of wild birds? Jim Bowie. <laughs> Hello, John. How are you? But, Jim, you're aging so rapidly. You're growing so old. Huh? I am? Am I, am I getting old? Oh, not your face. Your eyes. You have just shot a turkey that has been dead for three days. Dead for three days? Why, well, it looks a life like sitting up there. I propped it up with sticks and wire so I could paint it. <laughs> if you knew the trouble I went to even finding one, wild turkey cocks are getting rarer every year. Especially a specimen as magnificent as this one. Now you've ruined him. Why can you blame me for wanting to kill you? No, I suppose not. Tell you what, John, I was on my way home, but uh, I'll stay and help you hunt another. Agreed. I'm glad to find you are still a gentleman. Oh, I got a little surprise for you. Something you wanted pretty bad last time I was here. Come oh. with me. I was just on the way up to the plantation house to see you. Here you are. Golden pheasant. This is wonderful. What size and color? And <laughs> two of them. <laughs> oh, well, only one is for painting. Uh, the other one is for something you usually forget to do, John. Huh? Eating. Oh. <laughs> Here, you, you can paint the one with the long tail feathers. <laughs> Isn't she beautiful, Jim? You know, I tramp through the woods the marshes, the bayous, day after day. Until finally, one afternoon, she came right into my head. Mm. And this. The mallard. You know, I lay in the swamp one night, soaked my skin <laughs> to shoot one in the morning. Do you like them, Jim? You are a woodsman. Tell me what you think of my birds. Well, now, look at this. John, I'm no judge of art or even an expert on birds. But when I look at one of your pictures, it's as if... I mean, it's just as if I was seeing that bird for the very first time, even though I may have seen it a hundred times before. Precisely. That's what I want to show. The bird and the environment all must be true. And yet, it's pleasing. <laughs> yeah, John, but why the hurry? I mean... You'll be running out of birds soon to paint. And I will paint the animals and the insects of America. <laughs> it would take two lifetimes to do it all. Must be a kind of nice feeling to know just what you want to do for the rest of your life. Don't you, Jim? No. No, I have no talent like this. There's nothing I can do that anyone will ever remember me for. But, Jim, you have a marvelous talent for living fully and, and with style, you know. Young as you are already, you have made your presence felt. Me, all they will ever remember of me, uh, my birds. Someone hunting. Ah! I'm 
He's hurt bad. You stay with him. I'll see if I can catch him. Careful, Jim. They're armed. But not to pursue the robbers. He needs a doctor more than he needs revenge. When he comes, je suis blessé. Soyez tranquille, vous êtes hors de danger avec nous. Monsieur Bowie, je m'appelle Audubon. Tous les deux des hommes de bonne volonté. Charles Jacques Audubon? Oui, monsieur. Alors prenez garde, Votre Excellence. On vous poursuit. Votre vie est en danger. What did he say? It was very strange. He knew my full name. He called me Sire. He said my life was in danger. Why would your life be in danger? I wouldn't know. You better ride to Baton Rouge for Dr. Menard. This one is in much more danger than I. Oh, and stop first at the plantation and have them send a wagon. Then bring the doctor there. The plantation to which Audubon brought the wounded Frenchman and Jim the doctor from Baton Rouge was owned by the Piri family of Feliciana Parish. Here, Audubon and his wife Lucy lived with their two boys, Lucy helping to pay their way by teaching school, Audubon by giving music and dancing lessons. Poor though they were, their quiet charm and artistic sensitivity made them warmly welcome in the leisurely way of plantation life. Where are the boys, Mrs. Audubon? I miss them. Well, they're staying with friends for a few days over in Latour Parish. Oh. Grown up fast, are they? You should see them. Very handsome young gentlemen they are, too. Hmm. Still unconscious. Then you didn't find out anything more. Doctor doesn't give you much hope. To think such a thing could happen in our very own woods. Oh, dear. More visitors. I have a feeling this is going to be one of those hectic days. You know, Jim, it didn't strike me as an ordinary robbery. There was something vindictive about it, as though the men were personal enemies. At times, dear, you have such a romantic imagination. <laughs> the Marquis de Lantanac. My word, a Marquis. Well, don't just stand there, Toby. Show him out here. Please pardon the intrusion, mesdames, messieurs. It is a rare honor to receive a marquis. <laughs> a marquis in exile and in memory only, madame. Since the horrible revolution, one must be cautious with titles. Ah, oh, yes. But enough of myself for the moment, pray. You are, I presume, the lady of the house? Your pardon, marquis. I am Mrs. Peary. You are most welcome to this house, if there's anything you wish. Uh, information only, madame. I am seeking a certain gentleman and when I have found him and given him my message, my business will be finished. Now tell me, do you have one living here named Jean-Jacques Audubon? I'm Audubon, sir. May I have the pleasure of introducing as your servant, a most humble subject. I thank heaven you are safe and in good health, your majesty. Is this a joke? What? Uh, what is this? Come on your feet, man. This is America. I'm only showing the respect and reverence due to the King of France, Your Majesty. I can appreciate the joke as well as the next one, Monsieur. Just don't carry it too far. I know it is difficult to believe, sire. But surely you must have suspected. 
Suspected what? If it please your majesty, certain papers have come to light which prove conclusively that you are the second son of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, his queen. That you are Louis Charles XVII, rightful heir to the throne of France. <laughs> the Dauphin? A king, your majesty, and John. <laughs> Now, look here, sir. If you think I am the long-lost Dauphin, why, is that a nonsense? I want it stopped. What you call it, Your Majesty, cannot alter the facts. France is in a state of turmoil. She needs you. A strong cartel of aristocrats have pledged their lives if you will but claim your heritage. A ship awaits you now in New Orleans Harbor to take you back to France. What if it is true, John? It could be, couldn't it? Ridiculous. I was born April 26, 1785, in Les Cages, on the island of Saint-Domingue. Can you prove your date and place of birth, Your Majesty? I take the word of my good father, the Capitaine. Rest his soul. And stop calling me Your Majesty! A thousand pounds, sire, but you precisely made my point. You cannot prove your statement, but we can prove ours. It is possible, darling. The least you could do is let the gentleman show you the proof. Unfortunately, madame, I do not have this proof on my person. Those valuable documents rest with certain well-chosen compatriots who even now await his majesty in Baton Rouge. It's not because I love you so much, darling, but I really have felt you were superior to other men in, in, in so many ways. <laughs> I am an American by choice. A plain, simple, happy man, made so by good fortune, a little talent, and a loving wife. If I should go with you to France, uh, what happens to my wife? Since she's not of noble birth, I assume an annulment could be arranged. She could accompany you, of course. Accompany me. <laughs> There is your answer, sir. Now, if you will excuse us. I beg to state to your majesty uh, that you my... You heard what he said, monsieur. You can at least respect their privacy. I respect your privacy, sir, and I respect you. But this is more than that. Your life is in danger. That's the second time today I've heard that warning. Why is my life in danger? You said the second time, sire. You were previously warned? This morning, also by a Frenchman. He lies wounded upstairs. This man warned you? Same as you did. We're still a little curious to know why. He didn't tell you? No, he warned me. He's been unconscious ever since. I shudder to think who this man might be. May I have permission to see him, sire? Well, I don't see why not. The sooner we get to the bottom of all this, the better. We'll take you out. This is not our friend, sire. This is our enemy. One of the secret society of the Charbonnerie. Dedicated to the complete annihilation of the Royal Bourbon line. He's here in America to kill you. He doesn't seem so fierce. It's incredible. His presence here proves only one thing, sire. Your enemies have found you before we did. Your Majesty must not remain here, isolated and unprotected. If there are fanatics about, they won't stop with me. I'm worried about Lucy and my boys. Yes? And where are your sons, sire? Well, they're over um, there are visiting friends, monsieur. And monsieur is suspicious of me. Mm, well, I just think we ought to wait and hear this man's side of the story, that's all. Quite right. You're quite right to be suspicious. Therefore, I suggest that you, sire, go immediately with your wife to Baton Rouge and place yourselves under the full protection of the civil authorities. He's right about protection, John. I think you ought to go. You coming, Jim? No, no, I'll, I'll wait here. If any more Frenchmen turn up to warn you your life's in danger, I'll take the message. <laughs>
With the Marquis de Lantanac riding his escort, Audubon and his wife left the plantation shortly before nightfall. Inside the carriage, both were remembering the tales they had heard of the lost Dauphin, of the little ten-year-old boy, the son of a king and queen doomed to die under the guillotine. They remembered the plots against the boy's life and of his being given into the custody of a shoemaker only to fall ill and allegedly die. But there was no certificate of death, nor any witnesses. Lucy couldn't help wondering. Listen closely, he has little time left. Yes? Monsieur Dubon? No. No, I'm his friend, Jim Boy. What is your concern for Mr. Audubon? I have come to warn him. His life is in danger. The Marquis has already told us that. The Marquis? The Marquis de Lontanac. That cannot be, monsieur. I am the Marquis de Lantanac. Don't lie. Don't lie to me. I am not lying. Easy, monsieur. Your wound's very grave. I know. I am dying. The other is the one who lies. He will kill the Dauphin. He has said all he'll ever say. Is he dead? You think he was lying, Doctor? Who knows? If he wasn't lying, then the other one was. And he's taking the Audubon to Baton Rouge. I've got to go to Baton Rouge to make arrangements. I'll go with you. I haven't time to wait for you. Wrong, Marquis? Do not use that revolting title from now on, Monsieur. It is with pride that I tell you I'm a man of the Republic. What? You're my prisoner, Monsieur. You'll be tried tonight in Baton Rouge before the sons of the French Revolution. If you cannot prove that you are not the Dauphin, you will die. Oh, no. Back in the carriage, Monsieur. Monsieur. Vive la Please don't worry, my dear. This is America. No Frenchman dare try me here. that in there? 
It's Moe's doctor, Miss Perry's driver. What was all the shooting about? They done killed Mr. Jim over there in the woods. Jim's shoulder wound, after detention by the doctor, proved to be not so serious that he couldn't continue his pursuit of the Audubons and their abductors. He and the good doctor spurred their horses toward Baton Rouge. By the time Jim and Dr. Maynard reached Baton Rouge, they had decided that Doc would alert the police while Jim inquired at the inn for information about a Frenchman answering the description of the false Marquis. Jim learned from the innkeeper that the Marquis de Lantanac had ordered his baggage sent to the steamboat warehouse near the landing. The man who gave such orders must obviously be the false Marquis. Who is he? The reporter from the Red Lion Inn, sir. All right, Porter. Uh, bring the luggage inside. Yes, sir. Uh, put them over there, Porter, with these things. Yes, sir. And be quick about it. Depeche, Porter, hurry. Yes, sir. All right, all right, all right. Here, this is for you. Thank you, sir. Make one sound, that'll be your last. Are the Audubon still alive? Are they? Oui, monsieur. Where are they? Uh, over there. You're taking it to them. I don't think you can run faster or dodge quicker than this knife. Oui, monsieur. Go on, move. Frenchman, the release of the Audubons, or this one dies. He jumped! came to say goodbye before I start on home. You will excuse me, friend. There is only so much good light in a day. Oh. John, there's, uh, there's one thing I'd like to know, and you have my word for it, won't go any further. Yes, Jim? Are you really the Dauphin? It might very well be that I am. I happen to think not, but even if it were, I would not exchange this and this for all the kingdoms in the world. Now, you get along and let me work. Yes, your majesty. Ah. <laughs> Audubon never mentioned the adventure in his famous journals. Yet there are those who still believe he was the lost Dauphin. Who knows? It remains one of the great historical mysteries of all time. And here's the star of our show, Scott Forbes. Hello, everyone. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. And we'll be with us again next week for another exciting adventure in the life of Jim Boy. Jim Bowie, he roamed the wilderness unafraid from Natchez to Rio Grande, 
With all the might of his gleaming blade, he fought for the rights of man. Jim Bowie, Jim Bowie, he was a bold, adventuring man. Jim Bowie, Jim Bowie, battled for right with a powerful hand. His blade was tempered and so was he. Indestructible steel was he, Jim Bowie, Jim Bowie. He was a fighter, a fearless and mighty adventurer man.